Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Christian Skeptic. I'm your host, Sean Kerwin, and as always, it's my mission to take an honest look at our questions about Christianity through the lens of logic and reason. I'm not here to preach at you, just to start a conversation with you. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, it's been a little minute since I've recorded an episode, and I do apologize about that. Life has just been uh, kind of a bit more busy and a bit more hectic, and I feel like the last episode I recorded was not (laughs) our typical episode or conversation or adventure or endeavor we we have been embarking on together as far as uh, finding a question that culture or church or maybe someone's asking and kind of digging into like the rationale and everything behind it. And fair enough, I feel like this year started off kind of a bit messier and a bit more jumbled. And so, so go my thoughts. <laughs> They're a bit messier and a bit more jumbled. And I suppose half of this is my own fault. It has been now uh, almost exactly four years since I stepped out of pastoral ministry and back into the world of engineering and technology and research and development. And it's been a good ride and I've really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed utilizing that part of my brain, but a few months back, part of me was really missing the counseling aspect of pastoral ministry. That and teaching apologetics were my two favorite parts of being a pastor. And so I kind of felt like God was putting on my heart to serve somewhere, maybe to get involved in a church in a capacity in which I could counsel people and and really just dive through scripture and, and, and figure out what God's will is for their lives. And it's weird. God did not bring anywhere to serve formally in a church to me, but he brought friends and he brought opportunities to speak into people's lives where they have been going through calamity. They have been going through trial and tribulation, and it's been hard. I've put my counseling shoes back on, as it were, and have been walking through muck and mire and some awful stuff that that people do and that people fall into as perpetrators and as victims of really what is the result of sin in this world. And it gives one pause to walk through a trial with someone. It certainly gives someone pause to walk through a trial themselves and to kind of have this moment of... (laughs) Who is God? What is he really about? What is life about? Why suffering and pain and trial and calamity and just messy, icky, crappy relationships happen in this world? Relationships between neighbors, between people, between strangers, between spouses. And and then <laughs> add to that, for whatever reason, I've really had this obsession with Leviticus lately and don't ask me why, because that's super weird. And, and Leviticus is the book, right? Like if, if you do one of those, I'm going to go through the Bible in a year. I'm going to go from Genesis to Revelation, like cover to cover, like in the Bible. And 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 you, you get to Genesis and it's really weird. And there's this creation myth and this flood myth and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, his brothers, that whole thing. You get to Exodus, it's Moses, and, and it's just freaking action packed, right? And then it kind of isn't as action-packed when you get to the law. And then Leviticus, I feel like that's the book that most people kind of just stop at. And most people just kind of like lose that steam and that forward momentum. And, and Leviticus is the book where the Bible in a year and the Bible cover-to-cover plans generally stop. But I've been stopped there and stuck there, <laughs> as it were, I guess, for the past little while. And then on top of that, I read through Faust by Van Gouda, the German playwright. And that's a story of Faust, this doctor who is bored with life and, and, and wants this fulfillment, wants this, this quest to know what the spiritual realm is like. He wants love and he, he finds that in Gretchen, the, the young maiden he becomes infatuated with, right? And Mephistopheles, this, this devil, (laughs) is the one that essentially gets Faust to sell his soul to him in return for all of this, all of the accoutrements and fulfillments of life. And for no other really apparent reason other than that, Faust is just bored, right? Like like he's lost the the splendor and the appreciation and respect and awe for life and what he knows about theology and, and 
he's just, you know, looking around and is like, give me something that, that makes me appreciate beauty. Give me something that, that makes me see that this is all, you know, not just worth living, but that there's, there's purpose and splendor and, and beauty and point behind everything. And it's an interesting story. And then an author that I, I really love and am in no way endorsed, but recommend every single person listening to pick up this book or any of his books is Paul David Tripp. And I've loved him ever since he wrote Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, but he has another book simply titled Awe. And it is a fantastic, fantastic read. It's a very easy read, uh, which is not <laughs> something that I typically pick up, but this is a very easy read. And my gosh, it's kind of mind blowing. And again, <laughs> I'm not getting any money from this, not endorsed, whatever. Pick up this book, Awe by Paul David Tripp. And so all of that kind of leads into, I guess, what's going on in my mind right now and, and why I picked up the microphone and opened GarageBand and hit record today. And I don't really know what the episode that I'm recording is going to be titled yet. I'll think about it before I publish it, and you'll see some title. It'll pop up. But I kind of want to talk about that. I was listening to a sermon series by Chuck Missler on Leviticus, and he began, it's an in-depth, verse-by-verse, line-by-line. Like I said, I'm really in Leviticus right now. I'm trying to trying to read and, and, and dissect everything I can, look at commentary, sermon series, but, but he opens this sermon series, and I love the way he does it. He just asks, what is God's most important attribute? And, and then he says, well, for those of you that, are, that have been in church and those of you that have been Christians for a while, one of your first answers is probably going to be love. But Leviticus would say it's holiness. And and not just Leviticus, but the church fathers and the rest of the Bible would say God's most important attribute is holiness. And it kind of hit me, man, everything ties together, right? Paul David Tripp talks about awe, the fact that we have lost the awe that we're searching for when we lost communion with God in the garden. And now we search for awe in everything that we do. We take on too many projects. We work too many hours. We, we paint too many things. We become too obsessed with music, too obsessed with movies. We become too obsessed with, with, with transcendentalism and nature. And we look to every single thing else in the world to give us awe, the awe that we're looking for that is only found in God's holiness. And that's the crazy part about Leviticus is it's all the sacrifices and all the sacrifices in some of the most detailed ways that I guess I haven't even really fully seen or experienced, but I am experiencing and seeing now that the sacrifices, truly every part of it, every and it's very detailed, and it's very strange how much detail God puts into the sacrifices, God puts into the priestly garments, God puts into the tabernacle, but every single detail of all of it points to Jesus. In, 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 I mean, it's what the book of Hebrews is, is like really based on, right? Hebrews is the, the original commentary on Leviticus, and that's super cool. And God puts all this detail into the representation of Christ. And part of it is to show God's love, no doubt. Part of it is to show that sin is insanely disgusting to God, that God turns his face from sin. God cannot look upon sin. But then you read it. <laughs> I read it. And I'm finding that awe that Paul David Tripp talks about. And I'm looking at life, and, 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 and I like my career, and I love my wife, and, and everything creative and everything cool that's going on in my life, I'm, I'm very thankful and grateful for. But I realize the futility of it all. I realize the meaninglessness of it all without a proper perception and reflection on what is the awe of who God is, the awe of God's holiness. And God goes to great lengths for this sacrificial system. And then I was sitting in church this morning, I'm recording this on a Sunday. I don't know when this will be published. It might be published today. I might wait a week. Who knows? But I was sitting in church and to be honest, (laughs) this will sound weird coming from the pastor. I don't really remember what the sermon was about, but I remember that we read from Isaiah, the first chapter in Isaiah, starting at verse 10. And in the first chapter of Isaiah, God like opens up, right? And, and, and Isaiah gets this vision in the days of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And it's this condemnation to Israel. It's how Israel has, has forsaken God and, and they're living this life of sin. And he 
calls them Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, which is insane. And then he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? I've had enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. And it's like, man, I've spent a long time in Leviticus and there's a lot of detail of that. And God's just like, what's the point of it from you? I don't even like it. And that, that like hit me and, and it hit me in a, in a way that it hasn't before. And then, as I said, I don't, I don't entirely remember what the rest of the sermon was about. I mean, it was, it was great. It was a good sermon and, and the pastor's great. Right. And I don't know. I, I kind of, that verse hit me and the worship didn't hit me and the sermon didn't hit me the way that that verse hit me after being in Leviticus and, and, and the way that people's lives aren't as put together as they portray on Instagram and social media. I, I would say most people don't have lives that are completely put together. I would say most people don't have a sense of peace at the end of the day. And, and maybe you don't, I don't know. I can tell you, I've been finding a lot of peace though. And that's also weird. I've been finding a lot of joy in the book of Leviticus of all places, right? Which like you like human reasoning alone says this doesn't make any sense. Right. But, but I don't know, here it is. And and here are my thoughts. And, and then I had another thought that kind of popped up as to, and, and maybe I'll record an episode on this here in the near future, but I was just like, why is church so boring sometimes? Right. <laughs> like, like, why is it so easy? And I think I was thinking this while zoning out during a sermon, but I was thinking, why is it so easy to zone out during a sermon? Right. Why, why is it so easy to not throw your your arms up and, and let tears roll down your face during a, a song of worship. And, and part of that's just because worship songs are just so freaking repetitive these days. And, and, and the, the hymns full of deep theological truth are not the songs that people like to sing. So we just repeat the same verse over and 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 over again. We get louder and louder as we repeat it, thinking somehow it'll stir up something emotionally when every, maybe not every, but most people in the congregation singing this song aren't even thinking about the words in the song anymore. They're thinking about what they need to buy at the grocery store store or the fact that they just yelled at their kids trying to get ready in the morning or tripped over the dog or <laughs> whatever, right? And it's like, maybe that's why churches are so boring. And, and maybe sermons are more about trying to be relevant and make some kind of joke or be edgy or, or, or I don't know, try to show how the Bible can like shoehorn its way into whatever the latest political discourse is. And it's like, oh, the Bible's anti-racist or like, oh, the Bible's pro free speech or oh, whatever. Right. And it's like, maybe we just need to spend some time being in awe of how holy God is. Maybe. (laughs) I don't know. And maybe not every sermon and every worship song needs to fully get us into this moment, but but man, we might be better off if a lot of them did. You know, we, we, we look to, to movements and to people and to whatever the heck is going on in Asbury, I don't even know the state, somewhere <laughs> over in the United States, right? And we think, hey, maybe this will be a revival. And, and, and maybe it will, and, and I hope it will. And, and Lord willing, that would be awesome if we had a revival and, and, and if we had culture somehow make things better and, and people weren't questioning identities and, and, and questioning whether they should kill themselves or not in this culture. Certainly, like, I want all of that, but maybe that doesn't come until the church, and, and maybe not the church, because there's a lot of people in church that aren't God's people, but maybe God's people, which is also what, what, the, what the word Leviticus means. Like, like, and, and that's the crazy part, too, is just thinking, like, Leviticus, the actual word means the called ones, in a sense. Quite literally, the original Hebrew name for the book of Leviticus, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I'll butcher it, but it's literally just, and he called. And so that adds some weight to it, right? Because as believers, we Christians like to think, and we have a biblical basis for thinking that we're the called citizens of heaven, right? That, that term church comes from the Greek ekklesia, which is, is a, a, a legislative citizenship kind of title. And then we love to lean on Second Chronicles 7.14, right? Which God says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and they will, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And, and maybe, maybe the people that if they were called by God's name would just be in awe of his holiness a little bit more. We would see some of that Second Chronicles 7.14 happening. We wouldn't see Christians making sacrifices on the altar of career. And Christians making sacrifices on the altar of the nicest home or that new car. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you want to talk a sacrifice. What else is debt other than a sacrifice? Because, and, and hear me out on this, right? Like Carl Jung, the, the famous psychologist, talks about how 
we live in a sacrificial system here in the West, especially in that we we sacrifice present pleasure for future success, right? That's why we put into a 401k. That's why we deny ourselves everything we want in the present. And that's a that's a biological learned thing is how he sees it, right? I think it's more than that. I think it's spiritual. But what is debt other than sacrificing the future for present happiness? What is debt other than sacrificing the the awe and, and, and the circumspection of what God the provider and, and being in awe that he's a God that provides will bring into your life into the future than to say, I want to be in awe of the thing that I can get now if I just sacrifice the future and I make payments. And Paul David Tripp talks about this, right? That it's like, we as Christians, as our income grows, so does our debt. That's a problem. That's a huge freaking problem, right? Who is your God? If you're making $100,000, $200,000 a year and your debt has doubled or tripled since the time that you were making thirty dollars or $40,000 a year, who is your God? I don't know if it's the God that calls you to do justice and to practice righteousness. The God that spoke to Amos the prophet and, and, and said that, that justice and righteousness should, should roll down like a mighty stream rolling down a hill, right? That's, by the way, that's the scripture that, that inspired Martin Luther King Jr. was Amos. I, I, I don't know if, 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 if your God is the same God that, that David trusted to provide when he was running from Saul. If you need to keep searching for things to be in awe of, if you need to keep searching for things to fulfill and to bring you peace, because peace ain't coming. It's like if, and C.S. Lewis says this, so, so it's really like this, right? If, 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 you, if you pursue prosperity, you're probably not going to get peace, and you are also probably not going to get prosperity. As a matter of fact, it's almost certain you're not going to get peace, and there's a 90% chance you're not going to get prosperity. Sure, you can pursue prosperity, and there are plenty of people in this world that do pursue prosperity, and they get it, but they don't have peace. Or you can pursue peace, and you'll probably get it, and you might get prosperity. You might not. You probably won't, but, but you might. And it's like the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. <laughs> moments of joy and moments of absolute hell are going to come for all of us in our lives. Moments where everything is well watered and growing and bearing fruit and prospering in your life and, and rain is coming and it's beautiful are going to happen, but moments of drought are going to happen too. And you can't control that. And God sends the rain in its season. And sometimes he tears down in its season. To everything there's a season, Ecclesiastes says. But it's like, wouldn't you rather walk through these seasons with peace on the inside of you rather than hell on the inside? Like if there's a storm ranging outside, don't you want the inside of you to be calm rather than two storms? <laughs> like maybe two storms battling it out to see which storm is going to have more of a toll and more of an effect on your life. And it's like, life's going to suck and you're going to die at the end of it. But there's a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. C.S. Lewis said, put first things first. And you might get second things thrown in. But if you put second things first, you'll neither get first nor second things, right? That, that if, you, if you aim at heaven, you can get earth thrown in. But if you aim at earth, you'll get neither heaven nor earth. And God is holy. And God is loving. And so, you know, hear me out. Like, I, I don't think God's love is, a, is an attribute that's not important to understanding the person of God. But a God that's just a God of love and not a holy God who must wholly w-h-o-l-e why holy judge sin you got the wrong picture of god if that's your view god is holy and loving and those two attributes must never be separated because if they're separated like wh why the frick does the cross even matter right but if, if they're not and if you can try and, and i don't fully understand it either so i'm not like saying i do or like like I'm still wrestling with this, and that's all this episode is about, is I'm just wrestling with my thoughts, and, and maybe it'll help you. Maybe we can talk some more, and it'll it'll spring up some more questions. And, and you know, certainly why is church boring might actually be an episode. Now that I'm thinking about it, I probably do want to record that episode. But we can't separate God's holiness and God's love. The cross does not separate God's holiness and God's love. The cross is a direct result of God's holiness and God's love. Blood has to be shed, that a, that a perfect spotless animal has to have it, its flesh ripped apart and be, be totally exposed, totally uncovered, 
right? Like every action, every thought, every deed has to be exposed, has to be recorded, has to be scrutinized, has to be, are you the freaking one or should we look for another John the Baptist to Jesus, right? And then that, that animal, that lamb has to die in order to actually satisfy God's holiness because sin, the consequences of sin is death. And God loves us so much, he's willing to be that animal that is stripped down, uncovered, torn apart, torn to shreds, laid open on the altar to cover our sins. And if that doesn't produce awe in us, then our awe is misdirected and misguided. And oh, how often that happens, which is why the biggest thing that's kind of caught me about the book of Leviticus is that it is entirely a book of grace. And there's a lot of consequences in there. Like, you get to the parts about the priests... And it's very specific how a priest should dress, behave, act, how he should minister as a priest. A- every part of his life is detailed. And if he deviates from that at all, it's it's death. Like, like the penalty for being a bad priest is death, you know? But, but there's something gracious about Leviticus where it's like God delivers an exodus and then he called. Right, where and, and one commentator put it this way that Exodus is all about salvation and Leviticus is all about sanctification. And so, you know, if if you disobey God's law, like he's probably not gonna kill you on the spot in today's day and age, you know, or I've met a lot of bad pastors in my time. Like I've met pastors that commit fornication, drunkenness, get in fights at bars, are completely awful in their theology. And it's like have you ever read Leviticus? Because like God has a pretty strict standard for that. But they're not dying, and, and I don't wish that God would smite them down, but I do look at it and say, oh, I don't know, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And maybe there isn't a, a literal physical death immediately, but it's like, you make enough bad choices, and you're killing off a large part of yourself and part of your potential. And that's a scary place to be, where, where, where you can live in such disobedience, and maybe not even disobedience, but disregard, for the sanctification that God graciously gives us, that you can kill off your dreams and your potential. But God's so gracious, he gives us guidelines. He gives us his spirit. He gives us sanctification that if we would live truly like we are his called people in awe of the splendor and majesty of both his love and his holiness, well, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be satisfied. And I think there's no better note to end on. So, as always, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed the show.